We are in the kitchen today and the topic is milk kefir grains and everything you need to know about them. You may have heard of milk kefir grains or even kefir yogurt. The kefir yogurt is a drinkable sour yogurt full of a bunch of probiotics. So it's a really awesome, awesome yogurt to drink. And the kefir grains are the part of this process that makes it all happen. So they're the living bacteria and yeast that turn over lactose and milk and give you that awesome yogurt as a byproduct. In fact, the process is actually a fermentation. So it seems kind of odd to think of it like that, but it's similar to sourdough starter in that way that we're having some fermentation going on. Maybe you've tried kefir yogurt before. We used to buy it prior to making it and we have been making it now for I want to say like six years, something like that. We've been making it for a really long time. It's a pretty straightforward process once you get the hang of it. I'm going to include some information in our description that you guys can read about and just read up on it if you're not familiar with it at all and where to also purchase grains if you don't have any and you're interested in making this yogurt at your house. Our original grains were actually gifted to us from a co-worker back in Oregon but unfortunately I had a mishap here in Alaska and I had to repurchase some new kefir grains. So these are actually new kefir grains that I got online. I didn't buy them dehydrated. I bought them already active in milk, sealed in a little pouch, but sometimes when you buy them, you'll get them kind of deactivated or dehydrated and you just have to reactivate them again. Right here in this jar, I already have kefir that has turned over. That's what I like to call it. That just means it's cultured or fermented. Um, so I'll refer to that a lot as turning over or it's turned over in this video. Let's talk about what you need to basically make it. And it's, it's very straightforward. You need the milk kefir grains and milk. That's it, beyond just you know straining and jars and equipment like that. I place emphasis on the milk because these are milk kefir grains. There is such a thing as water kefir grains or other kefir grains that you can use other substitutions, but our grains are specifically for milk and they need the lactose and milk to do this process. It will not work any other way, believe me, we've tried. So you've got to use milk with these ones. Milk, of course, is the next thing you need. And we have been really fortunate to join a raw milk share. Our grains can work with that and they can also work with store-bought milk that is pasteurized and homogenized. Ideally, you would use raw milk, it's healthier, but there's kind of a loophole how you have to get raw milk in the United States and you have to go through like a milk share and in fact Eric and I do not even do that year round so this is kind of like a special thing for us in the winter and I change them back over to store-bought milk in the summer months so if you're using store-bought milk that is totally fine one thing you need to keep in mind is it's got to be whole we've got to use whole milk that's what these milk kefir grains like so pick up some whole milk organic milk is better you're gonna find that your yogurt will just be a better, higher quality product. If you can't buy organic and you just get the cheap stuff, it will work too. That is how we took care of our milk kefir grains for many, many years. We're gonna dive right in and strain the kefir grains from the yogurt since it's ready. And I have a little bowl here, a little plastic strainer and a little spatula that I like to use. It's best to use no metal or non-reactive uh, surfaces, but we have used, like I have used a metal spoon before and that that is okay, but I would recommend a plastic strainer. I like to give it a stir so I can get all of that yogurt through the strainer. I've almost finished working the grains through the strainer and because we're using raw milk and it's not homogenized, it has been spun together really fast, the cream does separate. So I have found that to be slightly troubling with making kefir yogurt because the cream separates and it tends to kind of coagulate with the grain. So I have to actually rinse these to get them all clean and ready for our next batch. This may go without saying, but you want to have clean hands when you do all of this so you're not contaminating your grains or your kefir grains. We actually have a lot right here, which leads me into a little bit about maintaining kefir grains over the long haul. And I'm going to be setting aside this yogurt for now, and we're going to come back to this in a little bit. The grains once cleaned off remind me of like little tapioca pudding grains and they're not actually grains but I wanted to emphasize that this is the part that's living so this is what's responsible for you know fermenting the culturing process and, and giving you really the byproduct which is the yogurt. I grab the milk that we're going to be using for our next batch and I like to do just two cups at a time but the way the ratio works for kefir grains to milk is one teaspoon will turn over about four cups of milk. So that's a lot 
of milk, especially when you consider that you can turn this over every 24 hours. Being that I just don't have that much milk, I tend to reduce how much we do. We do about two cups at a time, and therefore I only really need really, really small amount, about half a teaspoon or under in order to do the process. Being that those are pretty active, I put a little bit under half a teaspoon, and you can see that we're left over with just a bunch of grains. So you may be wondering, why does that happen? what to do with these. Well, being that they're living, what happens in the process is they replicate. So you get more of them, you get growth. And it, division is crucial to it because otherwise you will not be adding enough milk to feed the amount of kefir grains you have. You know, you'd be getting up to really large amounts of milk. Depending on your grains, your frequency schedule that you're changing it over, you may have to divide more often than we do. I don't divide them very often. In fact, maybe if I'm turning over the milk quite a bit, Maybe once a week will I pull out some of these kefir grains. And you can use them for all sorts of things. You can eat them, um, which then on occasion, you can just put them in that yogurt and eat them that way. You can give them to your dogs, animals. I mean, they're totally fine to eat like that as well. If you're not interested, just compost them. I'm sure some birds outside would love to pick on those. Now we're ready to add our milk. I specifically like to add the grains at the bottom because that way the milk will kind of stir them up. What I found if you add your milk first and then put the grains on top, it doesn't really get stirred up in there. You can always give it a little stir too. If you're looking to make the yogurt, this is what you're going to do. We need to have a top for the jar and you can use muslin cloth or cheesecloth. In fact, that is what I used for a really long time. Um, I would have to double up our cheesecloth just so you didn't get little particles in there, but what I have found works really well is this little plastic ball lid we have, and I don't even screw it on, I just lightly put it on, and that's because you want a little bit of, you know, air exchange in there. You don't really want to screw it on tight and seal it off, um, not, not for long periods at least. In general, this only takes about 24 hours to turn over, and that's completely dependent upon how much keeper grains you have in there in comparison to the volume of milk. And at this point you are ready to basically set it and forget it. You can put it anywhere in your kitchen. I usually like to put it just a little bit higher on a shelf. I personally would avoid direct sunlight, but you can definitely put it where it's going to receive some indirect sunlight. And it just takes about 24 hours to culture. We're aiming for room temperature, which is about what we have in here. It's a little bit warmer with our wood stove. That's fine. Anywhere from like the 60 to 80 degree range is fine. What you'll find is if it's colder, it's not going to turn over as reliably. And if it's warmer, it may turn over a lot faster. So with this lid just lightly on there, I'm going to set it up here. We're going to let that mixture sit for 24 hours on the shelf. And I'm just going to keep an eye on it for when I think it is ready to basically get a new batch of milk. It happens to be a really obvious thing that happens with the milk. It starts to thicken and truthfully it just almost happens like immediately. So it'll it'll seem thin, you'll ch keep checking it and it will seem watery, it won't seem thick and then all of a sudden you'll go check it one hour and it's thick. So that is when you know that it is cultured and ready to be stored or used and you can go ahead and feed it again with some new fresh milk. Once you do it a couple times, you will totally get the hang of it. It'll just become a part of your routine in your kitchen. The most common issue that I personally have run into, and I think it's something that a lot of people also run into, is over-cultured kefir. And really all that means is that your grains are starved of food. So they have used up all the lactose in the milk, and they do not have anything more to nourish them and replicate, and you just have a real ugly mess of curds and the way that's separated, which indicates that they need fresh milk. So we've just went a little bit too long. Maybe we, you know, it slipped our mind and it's been 48 hours. Maybe it was 90 degrees in our house that day and it just turned over faster. In fact, it's really not a big deal. You just strain the grains and start a fresh batch. Um, in fact, I found it helpful to shake the jar. If you put a lid on it, screw it on, you can shake it. That'll help kind of mix the curds with the whey again and then you can strain it. There's ways that you can use that product or if you want what we typically do, because that does happen here, is I'll give it to our dogs or chickens, you can compost it, but I prefer to give it to an animal that will appreciate it. We're bringing back the finished kefir yogurt, and I wanted to talk about what you would do if you're not going to be using this right away. We are going 
to use this. We have plans. You want to store it in the fridge. At this point, it needs to be stored cool until you use it. Otherwise, it's just going to get sour sitting out at room temperature. In fact, the finished product should be just a really nice, light, runny yogurt. That's why it's called like a drinkable yogurt. It's not as thick as yogurt you'd find in the stores. And it has a really mild sour flavor. In fact, if it turns over right, I feel like, and you use higher quality milk, I feel like it's it's pretty fresh, clean tasting. Um, it can get a little a little sour, a little cheesy. They say that it has like a classic tang to it. If you've never tried it and you think you're interested in doing this, maybe pick up some kefir and see if you like the way it tastes first. We love it. We use it for so much around here. One of our favorite things to make with this is overnight oats, and that's what we're going to get started on. We're starting with some rolled oats in mason jars making one for me and one for Eric. And if you've never heard of overnight oats, it's really just that. You use some sort of liquid and sweetener. You can use coconut milk, chocolate milk, um, yogurt, and the oats absorb that overnight. And then you end up with a really awesome snack, breakfast, lunch, you know, anything like that the next day. I use both the yogurt and a little bit of milk because usually you need a, something with a little bit more of an even runnier consistency than yogurt. And as far as the ingredients, we're going to be using coconut shreds, chocolate chips, I've got some nuts, chocolate powder, chia seed, and we have some spruce tip syrup left over. It's also really good with brown sugar or maple syrup. We like to make these a little bit into like a sweet dessert. That's just my preference. You do not have to do that at all. This is an awesome breakfast in my opinion because it's very filling and it also stays good in the fridge for a few days. So if you don't get to it that first, that next overnight day, um, you can eat it several days afterwards as well. Another ingredient I don't have on hand is bananas, but bananas are awesome in there. They make this really weird flavor. I can't even describe it the next day. And I think that's because the yogurt's fermented so you get kind of a just a almost like a acidic flavor with the bananas but it's really good. I'm going to screw some caps on here and we're going to get these in the fridge. Eric and I like our oats to be a little bit softer so I add a little bit extra liquid um, just enough to cover the oats. Since I didn't use all of this yogurt in the overnight oats I'm going to pour it into a jar and I'm going to add the grains that were left over just into there and we'll, we'll probably eat those or eat this in the next few days and I'm going to put this in the fridge. One of the most awesome things about this is its versatility. I mean you can use it in everything. I'm going to say everything. You can use it in so much stuff. One of our favorite ways to use it in the summer is actually in a dressing. We make mayonnaise, mustard, and then we kind of mix it all together with oils and some spices, and it's just awesome for a dressing. We're always substituting buttermilk, sour cream, um, of course yogurt, things like that. You can just put this in instead, and you'll find that it's just, again, just really all-purpose. It's definitely become a major fermentation for us, just like our sourdough starter. We are on to making cheese, which is so awesome. Uh, we just discovered this probably a year ago, and we've just been making kefir cheese left and right. We love it for so many things. I'm going to show you guys how to make it, but we already have one that is, is cheese. You know, I already strained it, and so you can tell it's in some cheesecloth right now. I use grade 90 cheesecloth, which is similar to butter muslin. It has a higher thread count. You can tell it's a soft cheese. It's not hard at all. In fact, I think it's it's kind of similar to feta cheese slash goat cheese. It's kind of a mixture. Not flavor, but more texture. We're going to put this aside. Eric's making something awesome with this later, and I'm going to clean this cheesecloth because this is the one that I'm going to be using for making our new cheese. And the kefir cheese tastes a lot like the yogurt. I think it has a really clean, simple flavor. In fact, we usually add things to it to kind of liven it up but it can be a little bit cheesy if you're using over-cultured yogurt like we were talking about earlier. And that's okay if it's like two days old, but if you have some kefir that maybe you just completely forgot about for a week, I would just recommend giving that to your animals and separating the grains, giving it a new batch because that may result in more of a rancid type of cheese that you may not be as interested in. To strain the cheese, you do need this cloth 
and what you're first going to do is strain your yogurt as you would usual from the grains because we need to separate the grains in order to not put them in our cheese. We're skipping that step today because this is yogurt separated from the grains that I already had put aside in the fridge but just like I mentioned before just remember to strain it get your grains out first otherwise you're gonna end up picking them out of the cheese if you forget about them like I have done. <laughs> I like to do double layer cheesecloth so I just put it in a little plastic strainer and that's mainly to help me keep the form because it's it's liquid um, and then I have a strainer over a bowl because immediately we're gonna have whey separating and dripping down. So I'm just starting to kind of push it together so I can hang it soon. I'm gonna let it sit like this for a while till it loses a little bit of its weight and then I'll actually hang it on our shelf behind me. This is what you can expect from about two cups of milk. If you up it to four cups you're gonna get quite a bit more cheese. So I just twist my little cheesecloth up and then I make a little hammock. You can obviously do this with a little bit more cheesecloth. I'm kind of pushing it here. And this is the best part. This does not take that long like traditional cheese. You don't have to wait that long. This will be ready tomorrow. It only takes one day to drain out and you'll be able to tell because it will feel harder. You'll lose all that liquid. It won't be dripping anymore. And at that point it is ready to eat. You end up with what we had over here. And again, you wanna store it in the fridge if you're not eating it or using it immediately. It's no fuss, there's really no way to get it wrong. If you've gotten started into cheese making, that's quite a bit more complex with rennet and all that, but this is really, really simple. So I'm gonna hang it up right behind me. And I just use a heavy bowl to pinch it down. I just leave it like that. You don't need the strainer anymore at this point. I want to mention one more thing before Eric jumps in and makes us lunch. Uh, it's very important to remember that the keeper grains are much like a pet or a plant. So the better you take care of them, the better the product will be and the more active they'll be. The more often you're changing them with higher quality milk, you're going to get a better product. Naturally, that means they're going to use a lot more milk and you're going to be turning it over pretty frequently. In fact, the 24 hour rule is not a standard. Sometimes it happens quicker, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. So you may be thinking, is keeper grains for me? Is that something I can keep up with? And just from personal experience, I can tell you right now, you're not going to kill it. That really doesn't happen, so don't be stressed out about that. I would encourage you to try it if you're interested in it. And I also wanted to say that you can put it on hold. It's much like sourdough starter. Um, if you cannot keep up with it, your schedule just doesn't allow you to make it every day. You can actually put your keeper grains in fresh milk in the fridge. And you can store them like that. You can store them like that for months, in fact. I have done it, and I know it's not ideal. It's better to store them just temporarily for a few weeks at a time, pull them back out, let them come up to room temperature with a new fresh batch of milk, and then strain the grains, give them new milk again, and put them back in the fridge. If you want to do it that way, that's even better than trying to store them for a few months at a time. That's something to keep in mind because that's much more realistic for most of us who have busy schedules, and that way you can still enjoy the benefits of kefir yogurt and kefir cheese without feeling the stress of having to change it over and buy a lot of milk every day. All right, it is time to make some lunch. We're gonna be making a great lunch. We're really hungry. We've been making this kefir all morning, but we're ready to eat. We're gonna be making some sourdough flatbread, and then we have some silver salmon. We're gonna make like a silver salmon kefir cheese spread, and we're gonna put it on top of that bread, and it should be real good. I'm gonna make our bread first, get that cooking, and then we're gonna dice up this salmon, get that cooking, and work on our spread. So although I put sourdough starter in there, I also put baking powder and that's what's going to be getting our bread to rise for us. This is a package of kind of bits and pieces of salmon. When we fillet our salmon, arrow goes along with a spoon and gets all the meat out of that. And we like to use this for like salmon burgers. Usually we just dice it up real fine. And that's what I'm gonna do right now. I'm gonna cut it up really fine. We're gonna fry it up, put some seasonings on it, and we're just gonna mix it with that keeper cheese.
To make this salmon spread, we're gonna do the salmon, the keeper cheese, we have red onion and garlic, we're gonna do salt and pepper, and then we're gonna do a little bit of Everglades seasoning. And when it's all done, we're gonna top the whole thing with a little bit of mixed dried herbs. Well, this turned out awesome. I can't wait to try it. Kefir cheese is a really cool ingredient for me to have when we're cooking because it's so versatile. We've made anything from cheese crepes, we've made lasagna, we've made pasta sauce, we've made all kinds of different awesome things. You pretty much, in my opinion, just treat it like you would treat feta cheese. You do have to add some flavor, some salt, some seasoning to it because it is a little bit plain tasting, but I absolutely love cooking with it. Arrow's gonna jump in here and we are gonna see how this awesome lunch tastes. Okay, we're diving right in. I'm very excited for this. I wanted to immediately swallow it. I didn't even want to chew, but it's so good. Man. Man. That's delicious. Wow. We did a silver salmon taste test a while back, and we really liked it. It's a really mild, mild, uh, clean, just fresh tasting fish. Um, it doesn't taste like sockeye in my opinion, but this is wonderful like this. this with all those herbs and... This is great. I could see using cream cheese in this, but the kefir cheese, like I said, it's it's a great all-around cheese. It's definitely a good substitute because it does have like that a little bit of like a sour taste to it sometimes. Even though it is still plain, I know that's hard to describe. When Eric made the crepes the other day, he whipped it up with honey and vanilla and it was awesome. So it works really well for sweet things as well. Yep. You could totally top it pizza with it too. Use it like goat cheese. Yep. Well, as you can tell, that was delicious. Eric and I totally devoured that. Kefir grains are wonderful for the kefir yogurt, but we have just become such a big fan of that kefir cheese. So that's something that we really enjoy making. I hope this video provided you with some confidence if you are looking to make kefir and interested in getting some kefir grains. The biggest thing that I have found, and I'll tell you in my few years of doing this, is that it's better to divide your grains more often and have a little bit less with each new batch of milk, and that way you're not over-culturing it every single time if you let it go a little bit too far past. So that's my biggest piece of advice. Let us know if you give kefir grains a try, and if you already make it, please feel free to share recipes. We are always looking for new ways to use it. We'll catch you guys on the next episode. We are making a... Uh... One of the most awesome things about this is its versatility. <clears throat> One of the...